Today we're exploring the evolution and power creep of creatures in Magic the Gathering, from afterthoughts during the earliest years of the game to the absurd snowball threats we see today by looking at the best creature during every year of the game's history. 1993 Birds of Paradise from Alpha. In the early years of Magic, spells were way more powerful than creatures, which makes choosing the best creature from this era kinda tricky. By modern standards, even the most powerful creatures from the early 90s just don't look very good. Very few creatures from the first year of Magic still see play today, and the best and most important of these cards is definitely Birds of Paradise, which was great back in 1993 when players quickly learned you gotta bolt the birds before it starts making mana, and it's considered to be so strong today that wizards won't reprint it in standard sets. This said, both Urnum and Juzum Jin deserve honorable mentions as the best mid-range threats and finishers of their time. Why both cards look pretty underpowered today is four drops with okay stats but big drawbacks. Back in 1993, Urnum Jin was basically the questing beast of its era and Juzum Jin was kind of shieldred. Cards that were just really far above the curve compared to the other creatures of their time. Need a Birds of Paradise of your own? Well, you can snag one from our awesome sponsor Card Kingdom over at Card kingdom.com slash mtg goldfish 1994 ornithopter from antiquities 1994 was another rough year for creatures while legends brought with it the iconic elder dragon cycle which deserves mention for being instrumental in the founding of the edh or commander format decades later these cards weren't very playable at the time if it was up to me i might pick uncle estevad for the beard alone or really the beard plus the axe and the skulls you could also argue for elves of deep shadow but we're not just making a list of mana dorks but there's one creature from 1994 that has truly stood the test of time, and it happens to cost zero mana and have zero power, and that's Ornithopter. The zero drop still sees play today in various affinity style artifact decks, and costing zero mana makes it a support piece for some janky combos. 1995 Spectral Bears from Homelands. Our 1995 creature Spectral Bears shows just how far creatures have come in the past 30 years. Back in 1995, a 2 mana 3-3 that probably won't untap the turn after you attack with it was a legit tournament staple showing up in a bunch of pro tour top eight lists it was basically the werewolf pack leader of its era except literal werewolf pack leader which has the same stats color and mana value lets you draw an extra card each turn and turns itself into a 5-3 trampler but back in its day spectral bears was actually a pretty legit threat 1996 Balduvian Horde from Alliances. Another example of just how bad creatures used to be, Balduvian Horde, a 5-5 five, five for 4 mana that makes you discard a card when it enters the battlefield or you have to sacrifice it, was considered to be a pretty jaw-dropping creature. 4 drops just weren't that big, which made the downside more than worth enduring and Balduvian Horde into a legit tournament staple. Today though, a 4 mana 5-5 five five is probably a random uncommon like Sundering Shaman, which even has multiple upsides built in. 1997, Necrotal and Mana War from Visions. 1997s is where we see wizards starting to embrace a design philosophy that would turn creatures from underpowered laughing stocks in the mid 90s to the powerhouses they are today, which is making creatures with enter the battlefield abilities that sort of make them play like spells. Necrotal was essentially a terror, but with a body while mana war gave players an unsummon on a stick while both have since been in class by things like ravenous chupacabra and reflector mage the ogs were playable in their era in very important steps towards modern creature design 1998 morphling from Urza's Saga. Not only is Morphling the best creature of 1998, but when it was printed, the 5 mana 3-3 was widely considered to be the best creature of all time. While this is partly because of a weird old rule that put damage on the stack, allowing Morphling's activated abilities to do some silly things, the combination of evasion, pumping, and self-protection made Morphling into an almost unkillable game-ending threat, and the fact that it was so hard to kill also led to it gaining the nickname of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. The infant of Krypton is now the man of steel. 
Superman. 1999 Masticore from Urza's Destiny. As we reach the end of the 1990s, creatures have improved enough that we actually have some difficult decisions to make. Goblin Welder and Academy Rector both see play to this day as ways to cheat massive artifacts and enchantments into play. Deranged Hermit's ability to flood the board with tokens was unprecedented and allowed it to join Phyrexian Plague Lord in a deck called The Rock and His Millions. The Rock came out to surprise the millions. <laughs> The Rocks fan. Which is responsible for green black mid range decks being called The Rock today. Rafellos and Metalworkers' abilities to make tons of mana have seen them banned in various formats, but if we're judging creatures based on their impact at the time, the right choice for 1999 is very clearly Masticor, which was played in everything from control to aggro and combo because a 4 mana 4 4 with some upsides and some downsides was just super far above the curve for its era. The 4 drop is also responsible for launching one of the most absurd runs we've ever seen from a professional magic player, bringing Kai Booty to his first finish in Worlds of 1999, where he took home first place with a Masticor Wildfires deck. Over the next four years, Kai would go on to finish first seven more times at Pro Tours or Worlds, a run that has never been matched and likely never will be. 2000, Lin Civi Defiant Hero from Nemesis. Back in 2000, the legend rule was a bit different than it is today. Once a legendary creature was on the battlefield, neither player could play another copy until the first one left the battlefield, and this rule helped Lin Civi Defiant Hero become the best and perhaps the most hated creature of the year. Lin Civi's ability to tutor any rebel you needed from your deck, and even recur rebels from your graveyard once they died, made rebels an extremely popular deck, which led to a lot of rebel mirror matches, which were mostly determined by who played the first copy of Lin Civi, which would lock their opponent out of playing their copy of Lin Civi. This eventually led to Lin Civi being banned and block constructed, although this wasn't enough to stop the Rebel, which proceeded to win this standard Pro Tour Chicago at the hands of Kai Booty, who took home first place by winning yet another Lin Civi Rebels mirror match. 2001 Psychotog from Odyssey. This is a tough one because we have three creatures from 2001 that have really strong arguments to be creature of the year. First we have Flame Tongue Kavu, which was basically an upgrade in Necrotol. Sure it might not always kill the biggest creature on the battlefield, but it made up for this by having an aggressively costed 4-2 body. The 2 for 1 on a stick saw heavy constructed play and is considered to be one of the best limited creatures of all time. Second we have Spirit Monger, another piece of the infamous The Rock in his mill deck. Today the beast looks a little bit quaint compared to cards like Elder Gargaroth, but in 2001 a 5 mana 6-6 six six that could grow itself and regenerate was incredibly far above the curve. But the winner here has to be Psychotog, which despite its small stats, was one of the premier control finishers of its time, where it was often played alongside Upheaval, which would allow you to float mana, bounce all the permanents on the battlefield, and then play Psychotog with your floating mana so you could untap and one-shot your opponent the next next turn by discarding cards from your hand and exiling them from the graveyard to turn the 1-2 into a lethal threat. 2002 Goblin Piledriver from Onslaught. While you can argue for Exalted Angel, which was essentially the original Baneslayer Angel with some sweet astral slide blink shenanigans as a bonus, or maybe the Uncommon Cycle featuring Anger and Brawn and Filth, which have gotten new life in Commander recently, or madness threats like Arrogant Worm and Basking Root Walla, which saw heavy play in various formats, but in reality, 2002 was the year of the goblins, with the tribe being a dominant deck in various formats, thanks to getting heavy support in Onslaught. Goblin Pile Driver's ability to grow massive when it attacks with a board full of goblin friends and to swing past blue creatures thanks to its protection made it a key to drop in every goblin deck of its era and helps it show up in formats like modern and historic today. If you want to argue for goblin sharpshooter and that it's maybe even better, I'm willing to listen, but it's hard to beat the raw stats that Pile Driver offers to a goblin's deck. 2003 Platinum Angel from Mirrodin. 2003 offers a ton of strong options. Goblin Goblin Warchief, Chroma Angel of Wrath, Solemn Simulacrum, Troll Aesthetic, Seedboard Muse, and some of these cards saw even more standard play than Platinum Angel, but in reality, there aren't many simpler or more iconic lines of text in Magic's history than you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. Toss in the magic folklore of the story of the standoff in Honolulu, and the fact that Platinum Angel did see some tournament play alongside cards like Cloud Post and Tooth and Nail and Tinker, and it's an easy choice for best creature of the year. 2004 Arcbound Ravager from Darksteel. This is where things start to get 
really hard. Unlike the early years of Magic, by 2004, each year is filled with powerful iconic creatures. Tammy's would probably stand for Darksteel Colossus and its jaw-dropping stats. Johnny's might argue for Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker, which combos with pretty much everything. Spikes would point to Arcbound Ravager, which alongside the affinity mechanic, almost killed Magic before it was banned in Standard and still powers up one-shot kills in hardened scales in Modern today, thanks to its ability to turn a bunch of random artifacts into plus one plus one counters, while the more casual crowd would probably call for Commander Icon Eternal Witness. But remember, we're trying to rank cards based on how good they were when they were printed, back during their own era, not how good they are today. If our goal was to pick the card printed in 2004 that is best in 2022, it would almost certainly be Eternal Witness, thanks to the amount of plays it sees in Commander, but back in 2004, nothing, and I mean nothing, could top Arcbound Ravager. 2005, Watch Wolf from Ravnica. Through the eyes of 2022, Watch Wolf looks like the kind of card that might fill out the back end of your draft deck if you happen to be in green and white, but in 2005, Watch Wolf was earth shattering. Remember our 1995 card Spectral Bears, the 2 mana 3-3 three, three that probably only untapped every other turn? Well, a decade later, Wizards printed Watch Wolf, a Spectral Bears with no downside, and at the time, it was considered to be one of the biggest examples of creature power creep ever. It was one of those cards that actually made people say, I can't believe Wizards would print this, what are they thinking? Little did those 2005 players know that 15 years later, our 2 mana 3 three 3s would draw us extra cards each turn and maybe grow themselves into 5-3 trampling threats. Honorable mention to Dark Confidant, which many people consider to be bad during Ravnica's spoiler season, only for it to become one of the best constructed cards of the next decade before finally being pushed to the sidelines by Modern Horizons 2 power creep in recent years. 2006 Protein Hulk from Dissension. Protein Hulk, with the help from a card called Flash, did something that very few cards can claim. It broke Legacy, one of the most powerful formats in all of Magic. The idea was to use Flash to cheat a Protein Hulk into play, maybe as early as turn 1, and when you put the Hulk into play, it would die because of Flash's ability and let you tutor up 6 mana value worth of creatures from your library. You might think getting 6 mana value worth of creatures on turn 1 is already pretty busted, but it was even worse than that because there's combos you can tutor up with Protein Hulk. Back in the day, the idea was you'd grab a Karmic Guide and a Carrion Feeder, and the Karmic Guide could reanimate the Protein Hulk, and then you sack the Protein Hulk to the Carrion Feeder to get a Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker, and then with Kiki Jiki and Karmic Guide and Carrion Feeder as a sack outlet, you could use Kiki Jiki to make infinite, hasty, flying 2 2 Karmic Guides to win the game all probably on turn one. As a result, the combo was emergency banned, and while Protein Hulk has never done anything quite as degenerate sense, it still does occasionally show up as a combo piece in modern or CDH. 2007, Tarmogoyf from Future Sight. While Tarmogoyf may no longer be what it once was during its prime, thanks to more recent power creep, casually being a 2 mana 5 6 or 6 7 or even 7 8 was enough to make the Lorgoyf one of the best creatures in all of Magic from Standard all the way back to Vintage for nearly a decade. And even now in 2022, its raw stats still keep it relevant in modern legacy and vintage, even if it's no longer quite in the goat creature conversation. 2008 Vendillion Click from Morning Tide. Well, there's probably an argument for Figure of Destiny, which is responsible for the level up mechanic and an entire run of similar one drops that can power themselves up throughout the game, with the most recent being a Valve Sleeper. In terms of pure power and playability, no creature from 2008 tops Vendillion Click. A 3-1 flyer with flash is already pretty solid, and when you add in its enters a battlefield trigger that's essentially the blue version of Thoughtseize, you have one of the best tempo in control creatures of all time. Immediately upon being printed, Vendillion Click became a key piece in the best standard deck of its era, Blue Black Fairies, and it quickly made its way into formats like Legacy and Modern. 2009 Baneslayer Angel from Corset 2010. Before Corset 2010, which released in July of 2009 because Magic's numbering system is kinda weird, Corsets were all reprints, but this changed in M10, which not only had brand new cards for the first time, but was headlined by a mythic angel that was widely considered to be the strongest creature ever printed when it first showed up on the seed. 
Veinslayer Angel. Its stats and abilities were simply stunning as a 5-5 five, five for 5 with flying for a strike lifelink and some flavorful protections. This made Veinslayer an instant stable in everything from control to mid-range and even some big aggro decks. As a result, its price spiked to over $50, earning it the nickname the Wallet Slayer. In a sign of how much magic changed, when Veinslayer returned a decade later in Corset 2021, it was actually essentially a bulk mythic, costing less than $2, and mostly went unplayed in standard, but in 2009, Baneslayer was a sight to behold. 2010, Emrakul the Eons Torn from Rise of the Eldrazi. Yes, Emrakul the Eons Torn costs 15 mana, which makes it difficult for most decks to play, but assuming you can find a way to get on the battlefield, it is bar none, the most powerful creature in all of magic. Your opponents can't counter it, and they mostly can't kill it thanks to its protection from colored spells, which is already pretty scary on a 15-15 flyer, which can win the game in just two attacks, but when you add in that it also gives you an extra turn when you cast it, and it makes your opponent sacrifice six permanents when it attacks, it is as close as any Magic the Gathering creature has ever been to being truly unbeatable. 2011 Snapcaster Mage from Innistrad. There might be an argument for Blightsteel Colossus, which is the scariest artifact creature of all time and the only creature in Magic that can kill your opponent in one attack even if they have infinite life, or maybe the Praetors like Elish Norn and Shieldred, which are fan favorites in Commander and certainly have strong abilities, but the only real choice for 2011 is Taigo Chen's long-awaited invitational card, Snapcaster Mage. The ability to reuse any spell from your graveyard is incredibly powerful, and doubly so when it comes attached to a body which can be blinked or reanimated. Almost as soon as it released, Snapcaster Mage became a staple in every constructed format, being a key piece in the busted Delver of Secrets deck in Innistrad Standard, along with flashing back spells in various control and tempo decks, all the way back to Vintage and Legacy. 2012 Grizzlebrad from Avacyn Restored. 2012 was a tough year to pick just one creature from from. Thalia, Guardian of Thraven, deserves a mention for keeping white weenie decks relevant almost by herself. Crater of Behemoth is one of the best ways to finish a game of Commander, and it did see play in standard in the goofily named Hoof There It Is deck. Deathrite Shaman is banned in various formats and probably the best mana dork of all time, but since we can only pick one creature, it's gotta be Grizzlebrand. Much like 2010's Emrakul the Eons Torn, Grizzlebrand's high mana cost means most decks can't play it, but if you have a way to cheat Grizzlebrand into play, like a show and tell or some reanimation, it is one of the strongest cards in all of Magic, thanks to its ability to immediately draw you 7 or 14 cards while also having this huge lifelinking flying body. Its ability to draw a ton of cards is interesting because it makes it a combo piece in some decks, as well as just being a strong standalone reanimation target. One of my personal rules for cube drafting is if you ever see a Grizzlebrand, you just take it and then figure out a way to sneak it into play. Because if you do, you are very, very likely to win the game. It's that good. 2013, true name nemesis from Commander 2013. If we limit our picks to only cards that were printed in premier sets, Pelucranos World Eater would probably be the choice for 2013 as a four mana five five that could monstrously wrath away your opponent's board and created a pretty iconic meme in the magic community where whenever a new creature was spoiled, people would say that it might see play once Pelucranos wrote Rotated. But if we consider all creatures from 2013, the winner is True Name Nemesis, and it's not especially close. True Name Nemesis came to us from a Commander Precon deck, which makes a lot of sense. In a four player game like Commander, gaining protection from a single player isn't really that strong because someone else can always kill your True Name Nemesis. But in a 1v1 format like Legacy or Vintage, True Name Nemesis's protection from an opponent ability essentially turns it into a mini Progenitus, except it's actually way better better than that because you can still target it and load it up with equipment or auras. So as soon as Trinity Nemesis released, it became a top creature in Legacy, which caused its price to spike so much that you could buy the Mindseize Commander Precon it came in and immediately flip it for a huge profit, which ended up causing problems and shortages of the Commander Precon because whenever anyone saw a copy at a big box store or their LGS, they would just buy it even if they didn't want it just so they could flip it. Eventually, Wizard printed more copies in the 
price normalized, but True Name Nemesis continued to have a major impact on formats where it was legal. 2014, Eidolon of the Great Revel from Journey into Nyx. The easy choice here is Siege Rhino, which dominated its standard format, was the focus of some of the most well-known pieces of magic content ever, and launched a thousand memes into the multiverse. But the easy choice isn't always the right choice. Plus, when we talked about the most important cards in Magic's history a few months ago, Siege Rhino was our 2014 selection, which makes me want to go another direction today. Thankfully, there's another 2014 creature that is probably even better than Siege Rhino, as much as it pains me to say it, and that's Eidolon of the Great Revels. While a 2 mana 2 2 might not look like much, especially since its ability will damage you along with your opponent as cheap spells are cast, Eidolon is one of the best cards ever in burn style aggro decks, since these decks don't mind taking some damage from their own cards as long as their opponent's life total is dropping towards zero, and it's also a great sideboard hate card to fight against storm style combo decks looking to chain together a bunch of cheap spells in the same turn. This has made Eidolon into a staple from standard all the way back to formats like Legacy, and it still sees a ton of play today. 2015, Jace Friends Prodigy from Magic Origins. Planeswalkers are the most powerful card type in Magic, so being a creature that can turn into a Planeswalker gives Jace and the rest of the Magic Origin Flipwalkers a leg up over the competition in 2015. While there was some debate over the power of Jace when it was first released, since its creature side is basically a legendary merfolk looter, a fine card, but not the kind of card you'd expect to find on a list of the best creatures of all time, the power of its Planeswalker side quickly made it into one of the best cards in Standard, which in turn caused its price to shoot up to around $100, making Jace Friends Prodigy one of the most expensive Standard legal cards in the game's entire history. 2016, Thought Not Seer from Oath of the Gatewatch. Traditionally, Eldrazi were powerful but super expensive creatures. Take, for example, Emrakul the Promised End, which deserves to be mentioned as a runner-up for 2016, thanks to the ability to mind slaver your opponent with a huge, massive, evasive body, which quickly got it banned from standard. But the Eldrazi are expensive but powerful thing changed with Oath of the Gatewatch. In Oath of the Gatewatch, Eldrazi remained powerful, but they got way cheaper with cards like Thought not Seer, a 4 mana 4-4 four four with an ETB ability that's super similar to 2008 Vendillion clicks, allowing you to strip the best card from your opponent's hand and you'd only give a card back once the Thought Not Seer died, the power of Thought Not Seer in the other new cheaper Eldrazi, combined with Eldrazi Temple and Eye of Ugin's fast mana to make for one of the best decks in the history of the modern format, hearkening in the infamous Eldrazi winner where the tribe dominated the game to such an absurd extent the Wizards eventually had to ban Eye of Ugin to power down Thought Not Seer and the rest of its Eldrazi friends. 2017 Walking Ballista from Aether Refull. In a year dominated by massive indestructible gods from Amonkhet and huge dinosaurs from Ixalan, it's actually kind of funny that the best creature was a zero mana artifact, Kaladesh's Walking Ballista. Walking Ballista's double X mana cost offers a ton of flexibility, and its ability to remove plus one plus one counters from itself to deal damage to things makes it fine removal against decks with smaller creatures, but the real power of Walking Ballista is as a combo piece. There's really two kinds of combos that take advantage of the card. One is decks that can make infinite mana. If you make infinite mana, you can put infinite counters on Walking Ballista and hit your opponent for infinite damage. The other is decks that can put a ton of plus one plus one counters on a creature like modern hardened scales or even more problematically, the Heliod deck in Pioneer where Walking Ballista comboing with Heliod Suncrown was so powerful it actually ended up getting banned from the format. 2018 Arclight Phoenix from Guilds of Ravnica. Maybe the most notable part of 2018 is 2018 was the year where Wizards printed a 5 mana 10 10 in Gigantosaurus, and that's not our best creature of the year. Actually, Gigantosaurus wasn't even a very good creature. In modern magic, just having a ton of stats isn't enough anymore, which sadly crosses Yargle off our list of contenders as well. As opposed to a 5 mana 10 10, the right choice for 2018 might be the creature that made all 
all those big threats unplayable. Ravenous Chupacabra, which is basically a new and improved updated version of 1995's Necrotal, although an even better choice, and the winner for 2018, is Arclight Phoenix, whose ability to come back from the graveyard for free when you cast three spells in a turn as a hasty 3-2 flyer made it a staple from the standard all the way back to Legacy, and we still see it having a huge impact on formats like Historic, Modern, and Pioneer today. 2019 Questing Beast from Throne of Eldorade. You know that quote from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. Well, it was somewhere around 2019, at the edge of Throne of Eldorade, where the power creep really began to take hold in magic. There are a nearly infinite number of super push creatures that we could choose from from 2019, ranging from efficient adventure threats like Bone Crusher Giant, Lovestruck Beast, and Brazen Borrower, to some busted commanders like Korvald and Chulain and Golos, to finishers like Agent of Treachery, and this doesn't even consider the first Modern Horizon set, which released in 2019 with things like Urza and Yagmoth and Season Pyromancer and of course Hagak, but even in this sea of brokenness, one card stands out for the sheer absurdity of its text box, and that card is Questing Beast. I don't even know where to start with Questing Beast. It's a 4 mana 4-4 four, four legendary creature, but it also has Vigilance and Death Touch and Haste, which is already pretty bonkers, but then you keep reading and it just keeps getting better. It also has a form of evasion. It can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. And then the next paragraph describes how it keeps damage from creatures from being prevented. And if you haven't fallen asleep reading your card by this point, you'll get down to the bottom and find that if you actually manage to damage your opponent with a questing beast, you can also throw that much damage at a planeswalker. Think back on our list to 1995 and compare Belduvian Horde to questing beast. In 1995, the literal best creature in Magic was a 4 mana 5-5 five, five that made you discard a card when it entered the battlefield or you'd have to sack it. By 2019, this drawback had been replaced by three keywords, three abilities, and essentially a short novel's worth of text. And again, remember, there's like 10 other creatures from 2019 that you can reasonably argue are as good as Questing Bees. What a time to be alive. 2020, Lures of the Dream Den from Ikoria. Not only is Lurus the best creature of 2020, which is quite a feat in and of itself, considering the year featured all 10 companions, Uro Winota, and Omnath Locus of Creation, all of which were banned in standard in at least one other format, but there's a pretty good argument that in its original form, before Wizards Arata nerfed Earth the companion mechanic, Lurus of the Dream Den was the literal strongest card in the game's history, and that includes things like Black Lotus Time Walk and the rest of the power died. So why is this 3 mana 2 3 lifelinker that lets you cast a cheat permanent from your graveyard each turn so powerful? The short answer is the companion mechanic breaks two of the fundamental rules of magic. Rule one is each player starts the game with seven cards in hand. Rule two is those cards are random. With companions like Luris, as long as you meet their companion restriction, you essentially get to start with that card in your opening hand. And it's not a random card. It's one of the best cards in your deck. Players quickly realized that Luris in specific was super busted because its restriction was play a bunch of cheap permanents. And that's something that a lot of competitive decks wanted to do anyway. So there was very little cost to meeting its companion restriction restriction, which quickly led to Luris breaking essentially every format in Magic. Luris in specific and companions in general pretty much just ruined the game to the point where wizards had to take the unprecedented step of eroding the entire mechanic. So now you gotta pay three mana to put Luris into your hand rather than just naturally casting it from the companion zone. And this wasn't even close to enough to fixing the problem. Over the course of the next couple of years, Luris was banned in literally every format outside of standard, and this includes Vintage. And Vintage doesn't ban cards. Like, the Power 9 isn't banned in Vintage, they just restrict cards so you could only play one copy, with the one exception being Luris, which was just outright banned in the format. Which I think is a pretty good sign that this card is literally one of the most busted creatures that has ever been made. 2021, Ragavan Nimble Pilfer from Modern Horizons 2. Back in the earliest days of Magic, Savannah Alliance, a vanilla 1-mana 2-1, was an iconic, playable, and powerful creature. Why it didn't 
didn't make our list for 1993, it easily could have been at least an honorable mention. Well, in 2021's Modern Horizons 2, Wizards gave us the best Savannah Lions and one of the best one-mana creatures of all time in Raghava Nimble Pilfer, which is essentially the questing beast of one-drops. Yes, just like Savannah Lions, it's a one-drop that attacks for two damage, but as you keep reading through the card, you'll see that when it connects with an opponent, it'll make you a mana in the form of a treasure token and also exiles the top card of your opponent's library and lets you cast it this turn. So it's a Savannah Alliance that draws you a card and makes the extra mana every single turn as long as it gets in combat damage. Oh yeah, and in the late game where it could possibly be a not great top deck, you can dash into play with Haze for just two mana, which also lets it dodge sorcery speed removal. 2022, Shieldred the Apocalypse from Dominaire United. Picking the best creature of the current year is kind of tough, especially since the year isn't even technically over yet. There's just no historical context to look back at. My first thought was to pick Fable the Mirror Breaker, which does flip into a creature, although having the best creature of the year technically be an enchantment might be a little bit awkward, so with the risk of succumbing to recency bias, I'm going with Shieldred the Apocalypse. Since the 4-drop released in Dominaire United, its combination of pretty strong stats is a 4-5 death touch for 4, and the life gain and life loss it offers as players draw cards have made it the most played creature in Standard, along with letting it see Heffy Pie and Pioneer and Modern and Legacy and Explorer, and as a popular commander where it combos with cards like Peer into the Abyss. While Shieldred feels busted at the moment, I think there's some good news here. Unlike cards from the last few years, Ragavan, Lurus, Questing Beast, Shieldred doesn't have haste, it doesn't start in our opening hand, it doesn't draw us cards, it doesn't ramp us. It's a mid-range creature that needs to sit on the battlefield for a few turns to generate value, which seems like the exact type of card we want to see be the best creature of its year, especially compared to some of the super power creepy broken-y snowball cards we've seen recently. Still, compare Shieldred to Belduvian Horde or Mastacore and some of the goat creatures from the 90s, and it's pretty clear just how far creatures have come in the past 30 years. Looking for even more Magic the Gathering fun? Well, make sure to check out our video on the 10 biggest cheaters in the history of the game, or maybe the one talking about the most impactful set in the game's history that technically doesn't even exist, Spectral Chaos.